Okay, I want to welcome everybody who's taken time out of their day to hang with us for a few minutes uh, to our presentation today. Uh, my name is Darren Grosser. I am the opening act for Richard Cromwell, who I'll bring in here uh, just a little ways through this presentation. And I have been uh, a resident of the SolidWorks community um, with resellers for 23 years, my entire career. Very proud of that fact, and I've enjoyed uh, my career as a result of that. And I get to work with some fantastic people. So among some of the things that I do around here, um, we do a lot of content YouTube. Um, at home here, I've got some chickens and we've actually upped that to 25. So we're getting uh, two dozen eggs a day these days. So reach out to me if you need fresh eggs. But I'm also known to my kids as the treehouse master. And that's because when I'm not working, I'm actually working, but I'm usually using SolidWorks no matter what I'm doing. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, it, it's part of me. It's just kind of how I approach things. And from a sense that everybody else does too, where we're trying to figure out what's in our mind's eye and then be able to go ahead and recreate that. Now, I use SolidWorks because it has fantastic ways to be able to test things. And I try to bring my kids along for the ride so that they know that things just don't appear from nothingness, that there's, there's real hard work and thought and engineering that goes into things. But having a, a vetted idea and a, a method and a process um, you know, we can rely on is easy when you have a tool like a CAD tool like SolidWorks. So, you know, whenever we can use that to go ahead and make sure that what we're about to do, um, finally cutting chips, is, uh, you know, is looking good. And, you know, I use that, that term cutting chips. I actually catch myself on that because these days cutting chips is, you know, subtractive manufacturing. We're actually talking additive manufacturing. So another thing I love to do and I do often is 3D print. Um, it's really a big part of my life here. And for this very treehouse project, I had to invent something that would join a commercially available 90 degree right arm to a little extender I made so I could put the roof on properly. So 3D printing to me, you know, was always positioned as prototyping or, or just, you know, vetting ideas. I like to make end use parts. And we do a lot more of that these days with the evolution of our tools. Um, I really enjoy repurposing things. In this case, I got a nice trolling motor that I pulled apart and designed up a nice little lofted swept shape here in SolidWorks. And we printed that out. And that now is resident on my boat there as a uh, purpose-built throttle. So 3D printing is, you know, everywhere um, as far as I'm concerned and, and where the technology has gone with the types of materials that are out there really enable us to get that message out to our users quite a bit. So reach out to us, check our YouTube channels. Uh, we have a lot of information out there that's available to you about how we use things in practical manners. And, you know, maybe that'll spark some ideas for you as well. Now, I had a defining moment um, a long time ago in my life now. Uh, and that defining moment was walking into where my brother was working at the time, where I saw my first 3D printer. In this case, it happened to be a 3D systems SLA machine, but literally watching a connecting rod rise up out of a liquid bath because of a laser that had just passed across it triggered me actually to the point where I, that was the moment I decided to become an engineer back in high school. The point of this is that for some people um, in the industry, we know how long this has been around, but for a lot of people, they think 3D printing is new just because maybe they're just hearing about it or because you can go to Amazon and buy one of hundreds of 3D printers um, with just a simple search. But when I saw this, it was 1989. So unfortunately, I'm dating myself a little bit there, but it was a long time ago that this technology was, and that was at the time I had seen it. I'm sure it was there for you know a dozen years before that. But the point is, is... I've been in the business for a long time, and yet I find myself in a position that a lot of our customers find ourselves in, which is losing track or, or touch with the knowledge or the, the pace of technology in this particular case. So we're going to do a double-headed presentation today that's going to involve the CAD side, which I want to cover, and then I'm going to throw that over the wall to the reality side, where Richard's going to show you how we actually make this stuff work. But the point is, is during this process, I've gone through a, a real evolution of learning or relearning in my case, um, where I thought I knew a lot about 3D printing. And I'm finding that I know really just scratching the surface because of the rapid advances in technology and new materials, it's hard to keep up. So we wanna rely on people and I'm gonna rely on Richard because I just cannot keep up with the pace of, of the technology. My side of this is about how to leverage those. And really this is an open-ended type of an application. Uh, it doesn't matter what printer you're talking about, these types of things need to be thought about. And that's making sure that when you choose the printer that you're designing for, which in a lot of cases these days is actually the uh, order of operations, you wanna leverage the strength of that printer, but also understand its weaknesses because they all have them. And it could be cost, um, in a lot of cases it's strength or it's the ability to have multicolor. Again, there, there's trade-offs with every single one of these situations. 
Now, there's a lot of methods out there. I'm not going to educate you on this today because frankly, this is a list I made a long time ago. And this list today is a partial list. Frankly, within the Stratasys line, they're coming out with five new materials in the last uh, 12 months. It's amazing the amount of new applications um, for some of these you know, tried and true methods there are. Um, but the medium is what's changing uh, tremendously. And that's what's allowing these different applications. So we're not really going to get into that. Today, we're actually focusing more just on PolyJet. Now, PolyJet's clear advantages are the ability to make very realistic parts. Um, these days with color, color is very accessible. Um, you're going to see that a little bit later. But the ability to merge materials and blend them so that they have durometer shifts um, based on the, the blending of rubbery and, and solid, or the ability to change the colors to the 16.7 million color scales that are out there. Now, with these, strength tends to be the downfall, um, whether it's susceptibility to heat as a strength or whether it's the fact that they're a little bit more brittle with, with fine detail. Uh, they've still come a very, very, very long way from where I started with PolyJet um, over a dozen years ago as well. So what we're looking at right now is how we take the advantage of a printer that has a lot of colors. And I don't want to really steal any of, of Richard's thunder. And frankly, I want to get to him as, as quick as possible because he's got some great things to show. So this was my task. My task is for lack of any other reason, I wanted to make 3D printed fishing lures. So I want to recreate what I can purchase at a sporting goods store for about $5. And of course, my time investment and the materials is going to be vastly more than that. But this isn't an exercise of whether we should. It's more of an exercise of that we can. So with 3D printed lures, there's some things about this that I have to take into account. Not just printing it. I want to use it. I want to actually catch a fish with it. So we've got to deal with the limitation with my chosen medium here, which is polyjet, but more on that later. When we're talking polyjets, once again, we have great color, we have digital blending and strength is going to be my downfall. So how am I going to deal with that? Well, remember where we're going with this. Leverage the strengths, know the limitations. So with that, I want to jump into SolidWorks and give you an idea of, of how I got to where I got with this. So we're not talking about SOLIDWORKS design here. Um, there is some surfacing in this. I do have some nice organic geometry in there, but the reality is, is we've got a lot of other uh, content out there that'll show you how to do the SOLIDWORKS picks and clicks. What I wanna do is show you how to set this thing up so that 3D printing is a pleasure and so that you get the results that you're expecting. Now with this particular part, we've added some appearances. That's key. If you attended Tyler and Tate's uh, webinar a couple weeks ago, Talking about how you apply things is important because there are some things that look like they're going to work and they actually don't. And appearances is where they're going to work. Now, an appearance can be as simple as this. You pick your little beach ball over here on the right-hand side, and you can go ahead and, and parse down through the list of vastness that we have inside of SolidWorks. You get into steel, for example, and maybe we'll take stainless steel knurling. Whenever you drag it right out onto a feature, you get this hierarchy list. Do you want to put it on the face, the body, the feature, the part, et cetera? And one is going to override the other. So in this particular case, if I was to apply this to the face, that's going to put that material on that lower face. Now, that wasn't very exciting because it only shifted the color of gray that was there. But one of the benefits that we get of SOLIDWORKS appearances is if you take a look at these in real view, you actually get a very, very cool bump map that shows as a result of the shaders that we use with these NVIDIA video cards. The unfortunate problem is that though that looks awesome, that will not print. Uh, it's not supported. It's really more or less what you see when real view graphics is off, which in this case is just going to be the appearances that we apply to these faces. Now, these are all managed over in the appearance manager. So you want to be on the beach ball. You don't want to be on decals. I got to stress that one as well. We want to be on the appearances. And any of the appearances can be added or removed just by simply selecting and, and getting rid of those. So really, that's kind of where an appearance goes. Now, it's not that exciting in this particular case, um, though this is going to look very similar to the, uh, the commercially available lure I'm looking for. Really, just looking at these hardline colors isn't that exciting. It's great, but it's not really great. So what I want to do is show you how to step this up a little bit. What I want to do on this one is I'm going to simply take my part file, and, and we're going to do this at the part level here. So let's go ahead and just open up the part in its own window. And with this, we're going to go ahead and simply add the appearance with a right click. So now in our appearance manager, we'll walk through this workflow. What I like to do, and you're most likely going to see this as basic when you get into it the first time, is I like to quickly shift over to advanced. A few things that I want to take care of is I want to use a very, very, very custom appearance. In this particular case, we just browse for that. 
Now, when we browse, I'm going to go to my desktop where I have a beautiful folder full of fish skin images. And we'll show all image types here. As you can see, there's a variety of image um, maps, not just the, uh, uh, the types that are available from specific retailers, uh, Moto um, to be one, or the actual appearance files, which we're yet to create. We're just going to use an image file. Now, in this particular case, I've got to give a shout out to the uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife website. Um, these images here are really great for my application. So by selecting just a basic JPEG here, and I like this uh, yellow perch, what it does is it drops that into our interface and then immediately prompts me to save this as an appearance to be used later, which I'll just go ahead and call this one yellow perch too, since I already have one uh, mapped to some of my other files. Okay, so with that being said, what I now have is an image that you see on my part. And if we go ahead and try and change the scale of that, you'll see that that image scales up and moves around. When you go to mapping, you get some flexibility. I really rarely use automatic mapping. In this case, we're gonna project it. And we're gonna project it as if we're looking at it directly from the side view here. So we choose the reference plane, in this case, X, Y. Now by doing that, I'm allowed to go ahead and change the size and I can also grab the plane here and change position. So what I'm gonna do is, is kind of get that eye somewhat in place. We're gonna move this a little bigger and down a little bit. I'm getting closer. But what you're also seeing here is that I have other appearances that are applied to faces that are actually overriding this application to the body. So face appearance will overwrite a body appearance, or in this case, the part appearance. Well, that's okay. I can change that right now. When we get into this interface, I can select faces and then try to pick those faces. But what I've found is that this can trip some people up. Do you notice that I can't select these faces? The reason is, is because I'm inside the plane of my image. And when I'm picking, I'm actually picking the hierarchy of that image, even down here. But if you rotate this slightly so that that plane isn't necessarily behind our cursor, that will enable you to pick those faces. So now we can get into this box and start selecting those guys from the edge if you want to apply these to specific faces. Again, if we're in the position where that plane is visible, we're not gonna be able to pick them. But if we rotate that to a position where that plane just isn't behind our cursor, you see how I can pick up on that. Okay, so that's one way to do that. That's a, a, probably the best tip you'll get um, out of this particular part. Now, by applying it to the surfaces, what I am getting is just that. You look around the backside there, you can see that those faces aren't getting that application. So what I really prefer to do in this particular case is I'm going to go ahead and, and clear all this stuff out. Let's just go ahead and apply these to the body. When you apply it to the body, what you're going to end up getting is a little bit more of a rich experience here. And again, I'm going to change the mapping to projection. We'll project from the front, and that'll allow me to go ahead and make this thing the right size in the right position. We'll get that eye in position. And then I think that's all we're going to need to go ahead and make this thing look great. Okay, let's see, right about there. Nice. Now, with that being the case, I'm going to accept that. And I know that doesn't look right, but we're going to go ahead and take all of these other ones that we have here. And let's just go ahead and delete those. And good. So a little bit of an edit here just to kind of make this uh, better because I'm a little bit OCD as an engineer. Um, I believe you have to be. So that's gonna go ahead and take care of that mapping. Okay, again, projection, make sure we're right from the front there. Beautiful. Okay, now that we've applied this to the body, what we actually get is a little bit more of a through and through. And that leads me to one last thing here that I wanna talk about and I'll come back to this. I had a situation that I actually saw coming. Um, that doesn't always happen. That's why I'm really emphasizing this. The situation that I saw coming was that I had a lure that's basically a top running bait. As you pull it or as you reel in, retrieve, it's gonna go ahead and swim low because of the spoon, but it floats because it's made of balsa wood. Well, guess what? Polyjet, polyjet material doesn't float. And I found this by taking a polyjet sample and simply throwing it in a bucket and watching it sink like a brick. So there's another limitation I found in the middle of the process. Now, it's not a limitation to the materials, it's a limitation to the application. So let's be fair there. So what I had to do was a buoyancy study. Now. We're not going to get too deep into this, but you're going to need to know a few things in my particular case here. And I happen to have a chart that had the density of most of my materials. So that was a great start. And then if you want to go ahead and look up what buoyancy is, well, buoyancy is the ability for things that are really heavy and really dense, like metal to displace water and be able to go ahead and make things float. And like I said, again, I don't want to get into all of this for you, but you can calculate things in order to achieve your results. And in my particular case, it put me to a point where I had to go ahead and build in some air pockets. So back over to SolidWorks, if we just go ahead and hide this body, what you'll see is a couple of different things. First of all, 
a material that, or an appearance that's applied to the actual body is going to go ahead and be a through and through print, not just a surface print. But then I went ahead and also created some air chambers there so that as we glued this together, we'd have enough displacement with not only the material surface area as well as the air that this part was going to work for us. So every time you do something, you might learn something new. And this, again, was an opportunity for me to do that. So now that I've shown you a few things about how to apply these materials to the part, what I'm going to do is go ahead and throw this thing over the wall to Richard, and I want him to go ahead and show you how to actually make these things real. So go ahead and take it away, Richard. Okay. Okay, can you see me? Looking good. All right. Hello, friends. It is I, Richard Cromwell, Manufacturing Applications Engineer for Go Engineer. I'm based out of the Auburn Hills, Michigan office where I operate their new additive manufacturing lab. I'm also a certified uh, Stratasys application engineer. Um, I work with both ends of the digital manufacturing spectrum here, um, both the additive polymer based 3D printing and subtractive via CAMWorks and multi-axis CNC machine programming. Uh, my digital design and fabrication background and how I kind of got into 3D printing. Uh, for 10 years, I was the owner and operator of a company that manufactured uh, retrofit piano key sets and action assemblies for really high-end vintage pianos for conservatories, symphonies, major record labels. Um, Make sure you're and showing was... your screen. Can... Say that again? You're showing your screen. Adjust uh, my... Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you had a just... PowerPoint going here. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm not a PowerPoint kind of guy. Okay, I'll stop and get out of your flow. <laughs> um, I became enamored with uh, 3D printing through the printing of legacy piano components for very unique instruments. Um, the fascination prompted me to get a degree in technological science, focusing on CAD and starting to build my own 3D printers and CNC equipment. Uh, eventually, I decided to sell my former business so that I could concentrate fully on my passion for digital uh, design, additive manufacturing, and CAM. And that's what ultimately brought me here to Go Engineer. Um, so I want to thank Darren for uh, creating these models and working with me on this project. It's been a lot of fun. And moving forward, I think what we're going to do is briefly discuss uh, the Stratasys machines that we use to print Darren's model, uh, show the workflow I used uh, just briefly to show the process uh, uh, that I used to process the models in GrabCAD print, and then a short discussion about the different finishes and post-processing te post techniques that I use to dial in the model's final appearance. Um, so I want to introduce you to the machine that we chose to use uh, for these models. It is the J55. It's the newest polyjet machine that Stratasys has made, and it's kind of a cutting-edge uh, machine. It brings polyjet um, color printing uh, to a price point that was uh, that is considerably lower than it used to be. Um, so it makes it much more available. It's also a very uh, user-friendly and, uh, and work environment-friendly machine. It's great for the office. Um, so let me just introduce you to this guy. Okay, so that's just a brief introduction of the machine, but I want to show you a cool animation uh, that gives you an idea as to how this machine works and how it's different than the other um, 3D printers on the market.
So that was pretty neat. All right, so this is when I, th these are the models that um, Darren sent over to me. And initially when he sent them over, uh, unfortunately the colored data wasn't included uh, as the reference files for the appearances were not in the SolidWorks um, files. So this was one of the topics that was covered in another Go Engineer webinar uh, a few weeks ago that Darren already mentioned. Uh, that was from our application engineers, Tyler Reed and Tate Brown called Stratasys J55 Color Workflows. It's up on the Go Engineer YouTube page and I really encourage you to check it out when you have the time. It's a good one. Um, so what we did is uh, instead to have Darren simply save the GrabCAD print project file. Uh, so he processed it on his computer and then sent me the project file and then I was able to work with what he had sent me. And uh, just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to open up GradCAD print here, and I'm going to, what I did is I actually made a pared down uh, simplified version where we just have these four fish. Okay, and so what we can do is apply um, a finish to these models right now. We can go and click on the model. And change this to glossy. We'll do this one too. And then we're going to leave these ones in the matte finish. And we're going to add a polishing layer. So what this is going to do is a lot of talk lately has been about um, adding a perception of depth to uh, models, or uh, they call it displacement. Um, this has been a real popular uh, webinar topic. And there's some displacement abilities built into GrabCAD print, if you know where to find them. And so that's what this polishing layer is all about. You see when you have like a, uh, and, and you'll see this as, as we go on, when you have a, a polished uh, polyjet model that's being printed, Support material is really what causes the matte finish. And so they don't print support material on the top layers. And, uh, but if you have a model where, like it's a larger one, like I have this, this lady here, here, I'll change this real quick so you can see it better. I just printed this model and full color. And you can see how we have shininess here but then on this side, it's matte. And it's because this had support material on this side because the model was laying like this and there was no support material on the top face. And so one of the ways that you can get a more uniform appearance is by printing everything matte and then using some techniques to post-process them and make them more glossy. So I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, one of the ways that you can do add some... Uh, some depth to your finish, just like when you're polishing a table or a piano when doing French polishing and building these layers of finish, you're basically adding an additional layer of clear on top of the model that you can then polish. Uh, and so that looks pretty good. Now let's just do an estimate of time real quick, just to show you, we can click that estimate button and it will bring up, oops, we have some invalid models. I don't know why. We'll give them a quick check real fast. It's creeping up there. So what I'm doing is just having GrabCAD print arrange the models on the tray so that it's happier. And let's see if we can get it to do an estimate now. Yeah, that's all it was. 
Yeah, that was interesting. As I was dropping the models into GrabCAD, it was just auto arranging right from there. Even the assemblies or the multi-body parts. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's 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 a very powerful tool, and it does a really good job of optimizing the layout. Yeah, and I'll show you why in a second. This is really why why I wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. Is print time for these four models are is fifty three minutes, and it's because there are small models on the inner track. Now, if we just to show you how the J fifty five works, and you can see this area here is the transfer zone. If you remember in that video, the head was going uh, on one axis. It's just moving uh, this way. And so it needs that space to actually return to the center. But if I take this like a random model and put it out here towards the outer track, look how that changes because it's going to need more time now to get back. And then if we hit uh, I don't even know if it'll let me do it. Yeah, here we go. The time should jump up to about four hours instead of 50 minutes. So yeah, four hours and two minutes. And it also, this is neat, it gives you all of uh, the materials that you're using. You can see that in the um, J55, we have the Vero Cyan, the Vero Clear, the Vero Magenta, the Pure White, the Yellow, and then this is the support material. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I say that we might as well get this thing printing. So let's give it a shot. Okay, so here we have our models. It's kind of like the, the magic of television. We have our models all done. Do it in a montage. <laughs> yeah, I pull them out of the other oven. And so here we go. You can see that this top model is the one that we printed in glossy because it um, doesn't have any support material on the top. And this one has plenty of support material all over it. And once we cleaned that off, and here's a neat thing too. Uh, you can see here is the model that has no additional um, layer on the top. And then here you can see the layer of clear that we added. Now, interestingly, um, this was, uh, you can see here that there's like a, a notch for the spoon. And if, if I was going to do this again, I would uh, actually change the model so that this gap would be bigger to accommodate the, uh, the additional uh, finished material because it does change the dimension when you add it. So let's talk about uh, the finished comparison. So I printed three of these little um, lures and you can tell this is the one on top is the one that um, we just printed glossy and it looks really good. This one in the middle, uh, I applied six coats of lacquer to and it already had the um, clear layer on top. And so really out of the three and this one's the basically just the clear layer just cleaned off unprocessed. And I really think that the one that we used uh, lacquer on actually looks best unsurprisingly. Um, and if we look at the trout, this is the one that is uh, glossy. This is the one that I printed with just uh, the layer of clear over the top. 
And this one, I actually went kind of crazy and decided to uh, sand it all the way up to 2000 grit and then use a buffing wheel. And to be honest, I, I didn't like how that turned out at all. Uh, so if we look at them all, I would say the six coats of lacquer over the 0.6 millimeter clear um, looked at the best out of all of them. And then I had the two glossy mode. They were the second best. The matte mode with the six millimeter top coat unprocessed were third. And then the one that I sanded and buffed and spent all that time on uh, was totally not worth it. Um, I also want to show you one other thing that that top coat, just as a side, not relating to fishing lures, but uh, the top coat isn't just for um, being able to polish. It's not just a polishing layer. You can actually, if we, if you look at this guy, I printed this for a friend here at the office. He sent me this model that he got off of Thingiverse. And when I printed it on the J55, I thought, wow, we can make it um, semi-translucent. So that's kind of neat. But at the same time, uh, when I printed it, it just, the legs completely fell off because when the guy modeled it, he, he modeled it like a real um, balloon animal. And these were like the tiniest little connector points uh, between the different um, areas. And so the legs just popped off. So what I did in the end is added that clear uh, layer to the entire model. And that ended up making it strong enough that it holds together. So that's just another additional application of, of that ability. And so I think with that, um, it kind of brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me, here's my information. I encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm going to be doing a, a color workflow for the J55 that's much like that um, Elvin Archer model where I use, uh, I show you guys how I use Nomad Sculpt on the iPad with an eye pencil to um, color uh, STLs, any STL that you can find. And that's a powerful thing because uh, right now there's a, not a lot of um, full color 3D models out there. There's not nearly a, enough. And so now we're just starting, this is an easy way to be able to make uh, your own and it's fun and, and um, I think people re will really like it. So with that, I'm going to throw it back to Darren. All right. Hey, so, you know, really just in closing too, I, I just was going to say bye as well. And thank everybody for coming in. And, and it's, it's one of those things where a conversation in the hallway led to a presentation like this, where things that somebody just tries out of fun are, are what leads to inventions like post-it notes. I mean, really, we're just trying to see what things are capable of. And you only know what you can do just by trying it and finding out cool things like Richard said with the balloon animal, really great solution to that. So uh, again, on behalf of Richard, um, I learned a ton from this and I'm looking forward to the future here with more involvement with 3D printing, but stick with it, seek us out, um, pick our brains because there's a lot of knowledge out there. Just if you have a question, you know, get a hold of us. So again, thank you very much for your time. Um, thanks again, Richard, for uh, jumping in on this as well and, you know, take care. We'll see you again next time. Thank you.